This year at MongoDB World, we announced a bunch of new features and updates, and we also announced our vision for the developer data platform, right? Uh, so we'll start off by talking about the developer data platform very quickly, and then I will take you through how uh, MongoDB is simplifying development, right? We have improvements to time series, change streams, and the aggregation pipeline, all of which will hopefully life make life easier for our developers. And then Caesar will take over and he will talk about new features and updates which are helping improve data security and operational efficiency for our customers. Uh, building applications used to look very different some decades ago, right? And there are remnants of it which slow down innovation even today. When we talk to companies in the real world, they wrestle with tables. And it's not one or two or a hundred tables. Sometimes there are thousands of tables built over years, built over companies growing, new functions joining in, and new capabilities being added in. And we often see these massive entity relationship diagrams, right? Like the background on the slide over here. And to figure out what's happening there and what changes will break which part of the system takes a long time and it brings innovation to a crawl. In the 2000s, we started using NoSQL databases and with time adding niche data stores uh, address some of these shortcomings. Uh, however, it contributed to a growing infrastructure sprawl, a different tool and platform for search, for mobile, for warehousing, for dealing with time series data, and so on and so forth, right? Now, uh, developers don't spend time trying to figure out what the extremely complicated table diagram is, but they spend time on learning how to use and maintain these ecosystems. And there's data duplication everywhere, and uh, integration and building elegant architectures become difficult. And this causes a tax on innovation, what we call dirt, right? It's data and innovation recurring tax, and this slows down how, how much time it takes for you to deliver value to your customers. At MongoDB, we solve for this with Atlas, our developer data platform, right? It's built around the most intuitive way to develop apps. It makes use of the document data model, which itself is a superset of different data models. Uh, it uses the unified query interface so that you could work with a broad set of workload types, and it supports a wide range of modern applications that can grow and evolve, right? You can work on distributed applications. You can add in mobile applications. You can have them built on serverless foundations. Um, and all of this on a battle-tested platform that allows you to run everywhere, right? Uh, we are truly global, we are truly multi-cloud, and all of this is built on resilient and secure foundations. And where you had dirt earlier with MongoDB Atlas, you now have a unified developer experience, elegant architecture with repeatable models, and better data management in a more automated, transparent way, and reduced data duplication. We launched Atlas in 2016, and as you can see from this slide over here, we have been very, very busy over the last six years, right? Uh, we continue to invest in and improve the platform. Uh, we have added asset transactions. We support multi-cloud. We introduced our rapid release methodology from 5.0 onwards. We added field-level encryption on the client side. We added materialized views, time series collections, Windows functions, and so on, right? Um, and all this investment and focus we are making on the platform shows up in how much our developers love, right? We're consistently ranked as one of the most wanted databases on Stack Overflow. With 6.0, we are striving for simplification, right? We want to allow developers to develop, iterate, test, and iterate rapidly. And you will see that happen through some of the features and improvements that we speak about. So diving into how we simplify development, right? Our developers, most of you attending this webinar, uh, millions across the globe, work with a wide range of data types and workloads. And increasingly, we see time series data everywhere. So we will begin there and talk about improvements there. And we will continue on with capabilities to build amazing user experiences on top of various workloads, right? Uh, using change data capture systems through change streams and using expressive queries on the application pipeline. Let's start with data, right? time series collections. Uh, if any of you are currently using time series collections, drop a message in the chat box. We'd love to know how you're using it and how many of you are using it. Right? Time series data is present everywhere. Right? Think stock trading, crypto exchanges, uh, application website loads, and event telemetry, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, they form the basis for building richer experiences, such as the real-time tickers we see, uh, experiences on tracking things, and so on and so forth. And it's fundamental to me of the insights that we build into our apps today. 
we launched time series collection with spy.o and what it does is organizes writes so that data from a single source is stored in the same bucket alongside with other data points from a similar point in time uh, this makes it similar simpler for developers to work with time series data which in turn makes it faster so uh, with reduced input output operations and the lower storage requirements you have workloads which are faster and your costs are reduced as well and since 5.0, we have continues to invest and improve in it. As you can see, that there's another busy slide over here, not going to go into all of this, but what you need to know is that we have had new operators, expressions, and support for sharding and so those improvements to performance. Today, we're going to highlight a few of these. Um, specifically, time series collections now support secondary index on measurements, sharding, columnar compression, and multi-delete. Uh, we also had improvements to querying on time series collections. Uh, with new operators, densification and gap filling, and top and, and bottom end new operators, right? Uh, today, we'll be talking about some of these and uh, some of the operators and densification we'll deal with when we talk about aggregations later. A quick note before we move on, uh, a lot of these enhancements came in as part of the rapid releases between 5.1 and 5.3. So what that means is that uh, on MongoDB Atlas today, you will have access to a lot of these features. And if you're using MongoDB 6.0, in any other format, uh, in any other environment, you will have all of these features available as well. Right. Uh, time series collections now supports creating single and compound indexes on any field within the document, including the ability to geo-index measurements for geospatial analysis on moving sensors. Uh, those of you who have used time series collection on MongoDB would know that previously secondary indexes were limited to the meta field and timestamp. However, with 6.0 onwards, you can create secondary indexes on any field. So for example, if you have temperature data streaming in from a sensor, you could build a secondary index on the second sensor ID and the temperature as well. Uh, if you've used time series, you should also know that uh, what this allows you to do is build much quicker queries on, say you want to build a query that finds out when temperature has gone beyond a point or lower than a point, all of that becomes faster since you can do the secondary indexes on measurements now. From 5.0 onwards, we enable time series collections to take advantage of the MongoDB native sharding. Right? Uh, this means we can distribute massive time series data horizontally. Um, for a second, let's take an example. Right? Assume your meta fields are a combination of sensor ID, mission ID, and country, and you have a couple of dozen sensors spread across five mission types and three countries. Right? That's going to give you a cardinality of 500, 600 different uh, cardinalities. And with your meta field as the hash keys, identifying nodes with like, hashes, like hashes is going to be much more efficient, which means that you can handle this high cardinality in a much better way, which will allow you to have increased throughput for your time series workloads, right? In 5.0, 5.2, we added a number of innovations to the BSIN document model that provide columnar compression for time series collections through a variety of compression algorithms, right? like delta, delta, um, simple algorithms, and uh, gorilla algorithms, or anything like that. Right? Um, you know that on disk time series collections store data in the columnar format, and given the nature of time series data, columnar compressions dramatically reduce the database storage footprint. And, uh, Leveraging this feature, you in some cases, it, you can get up to a 30x improvement in cache efficiency uh, compared to regular collections. Once again, the benefit is that you have improved performance by increased cache efficiency and reduced input output operations when dealing with time series collections. Uh, the final improvement that I want to focus on when we talk about time series collections is improvements to querying. Time series collections can now take advantage of indexes to sort data by the time field and or meta field. Right? Uh, some time ago, we spoke about having the temperature sensors and building an index on the temperature measurement as well. Um, so what happens with um, sort, pro sort operations now is that they can take advantage of those indexes. And so last point queries, like what is the last latest temperature for each unique sensor, right? Uh, can now take advantage of this optimization to be much faster. Um, we'll talk about the other query improvements like operators and densification when we talk about the aggregation pipeline, right? Uh, if you want more information on time series collections and if you want to go in depth into some of these features and how that can be used and talk about different use cases, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, Michael Dargello has a really impressive MongoDB world talk on the topic. Um, if you want to learn more about it, let us know in the chat. I will try to find a link and send it to you when we send the show notes later. 
Right. Uh, let's go back to our IoT data, right? Temperature centers, uh, temperature sensors one last time. One experience we might want to build for our customers is that we want to kick off an alert when the temperature goes above a fixed value or is two degrees higher than the normal maximum zone. And one way to build rich uh, event driven experiences using change data captures on MongoDB is through chain streams. If any of you are using chain streams, uh, let us know through the chat. We'd be happy to know. Right. Uh, chain streams enable native support for monitoring and reacting to events and changes in the database in near real time and in a more scalable and elegant fashion. For example, let's say we store transaction data for an e-commerce website or online retailer in a collection called orders. Uh, we might want to initiate a notification when the order has been shipped or the order has been delivered, or we might want to know when the customer has changed the order or canceled the order and send that to customer streams or send that to the customer service team right uh, chain streams allows developers to do this right it allows us to build in this functionality right on the database we launched with 3.6 and we've continued to improve support for chain streams right in 6.0 we have a number of new uh, features uh, such as the capability of adding pre and post point in time images uh, having reporting dtl events optimizations new fields and more right so Let's jump into uh, point in time images. What are point in time images? It's a snapshot of the document as it was before and after the change, right? So pre image and post image. Uh, what is it useful for? Suppose you take the customer service example that I just spoke about, right? So someone has made an order, they've changed the order, or they have canceled the order, right? We want customer service teams to be able to figure out, oh, there has been a change made. We can capture that and compare what has been the change in the pre-image and the post-image uh, by using this feature. Right. Earlier, we had post images for insert and replace events. And in 6.0, we have both pre and post images for update and replace events and pre images for uh, delete events and post for insert events as well. Uh, these images are not turned on by default. However, once enabled by default, pre images are stored for the time period of the off log window. How do you turn on these windows? Let's, like, let's take a quick look at how we would set up the page image. For those of you who've used change streams already, uh, you would see that the code at the bottom is how you open a change stream. Uh, to begin with, if you want to turn on uh, pre and post images for a collection, you can run the, this command. Uh, you, for example, here we are specifying that we want to change, we want to enable change stream pre and post images for the orders collection, right? Um, and then once when you open the cursor, you want to say that you want the pre-image, pre-point in time image, which is the full document before change is required. And if you want the post image, you say that the full document is required, right? Um, how does this look in practice? Uh, so if you had that enabled and then there was an update to the orders collection and somebody changed their order, this is what it would look like, right? Uh, you would get the operation type as update you would get the full document. This is the post image after the change. Uh, you can see that the updated field here in this example is that the status has changed to shipped. So you can see the full document with the status has been shipped and full document before change, you can see that the status says processing. All right. Um, right. The next feature is reporting DDL events, right? By default, DDL events do not appear in the change stream. However, with 6.0, you can choose to track DDL events when you open a change stream, right? Uh, if you want to monitor what's happening on a database in order to replicate the same in a different database, or you have staging and production environments and you want to uh, recreate what happened, then you could use the reporting DDL events to track the exact sequence of what happened and recreate it somewhere, right? Um, Caesar will talk about cluster to cluster sync later, which is an amazing tool for replicating different uh, databases, uh, which he will cover in his sections, right? Uh, but if you wanted to see DDL events in your chain streams, when you set up the cursor, all you need to do is specify show expanded events to be true. And how it will look once you do that is that when you have created an index, uh, it will say that operation type of create indexes is there. You can see that this happened in the database test on the collection orders. And then you can see what was the index that was created and index was created on the customer on the field uh, on the customer field and it was named as customer underscore one right uh, similarly you could also track if an index has been deleted if a collection has been created a collection has been dropped all detail events can be tracked with chain streams through this feature right um, Earlier, if you wanted to track specific events in specific change streams, for example, you wanted to get a change stream only 
for update events, right? So that you could send that to your customer service team for them to know that some change has happened on the orders, right? Uh, it was hard to scale, right? But with new optimizations available, you can get up to 2x higher throughput for, for such change streams that use a filter and a projection, right? Uh, for uncharted clusters, uh, any change stream with a filter on it will be more efficient. And for sharded clusters, any change stream with a filter will be more efficient. Any change stream with a projection will also be more efficient, right? Uh, like I mentioned before, you could get up to a 2x higher throughput by taking advantage of these optimizations. So how will this look like? How, in order to set this up, change streams leverages the aggregation pipeline, right? We set up a dollar match to only filter for operation type uh, to update, and we only want to see if there has been changes in the items, right? If someone has changed their order. So we want to see that items field exists when there has been an operation type of update. So this match operation sets it up, and on both sharded and unsharded clusters, this will be more optimized now with six dollar bill, right? And if what if you don't want to see the entire document? You only want to see the items list so that you know what has changed, right? You can do the dollar project and say that you only want the items field to come in over here. Um, we saw a little bit earlier that we have pre and post images. So what you could do in this uh, imaginary scenario is that if you want the customer service to be able to compare what happens, you could have the dollar project to take advantage of pre and post images to say that, hey, I want to see a document before change dot items. I also want to see docu full document dot items to be able to compare what was the change over there. Right. Um, for more information on change streams, uh, Katya had an amazing talk doing MongoDB World 2022. It's also available on our YouTube channel, but if you want to know about it, uh, if you're interested in it, uh, drop a message in the chat and then we can find the link for you, right? Moving on to the final section, which is the aggregation pipeline. We just spoke about how change, change streams leverages the aggregation pipeline, right? And as most of you would know, the aggregation pipeline opens up powerful and expressive querying throughout MongoDB. Uh, since 5.0, we have had a number of new operators, and I'm not going to go through each of these, uh, but what we will focus on is we focus on new operators, we focus on query improvements, and we'll focus on improvements to search, right? Uh, quickly going through new operators. One of the new operators we introduced was top n. Um, say you have a collection like this on restaurants, which have, sorry, uh, on restaurants, which has the cuisine and score for each restaurant on the in the document as well. And we want to see what are the top three highest rated restaurants for each cuisine, right? Uh, you can make use of the top end uh, operator over here. You could set up a dollar group stage where we're grouping on cuisine. So we want to see the top three for each cuisine. And then we create a new field for top and use the expression top and operator over here. Right? We want to return three documents. We want to see the top three restaurants. We want to sort by score so that the highest score comes first. And then we have the output. We want to specify that the output, we want to see the name of the restaurant and the score. Right? The output looks something like this. You are grouped on the cuisine, and then you have an array for top with the name of each restaurant and the score over here. Right. Uh, what if you want to do something else? What if you want to see the last two items? Right. So for example, take this collection, which is data on auction bidding that's happening, right? And you want to see the last two bids for each of the selling items, right? In each document, you have the bid amount, item ID, timestamp, and bid array. You can you do this by using the last n operator within the expression on a group stage, right? So similar to the last example, we have a dollar group stage, we set up the item ID, and we create a last bids field where we use the last n operator, we say return two documents for us, and use the bid amount and time series uh, fields in it. And the output would look something like this. For item number one, uh, we have a last bids field, which is an array of two documents in it, uh, which has the bid and the time series data. You'll notice here that the bid, uh, that the array is not sorted in any specific manner. It's not sorted on bid, it's not sorted on the timestamp itself, right? Um, we have a new operator, sort array, which enables us to work with arrays without having to unwind them, right? So if you wanted to sort the array that we got in the last stage by the bid value, then we can set up another stage, a dollar set stage, and take the last bids, uh, last bits field, use the sort array operator in here, and take an input as last bids and sort by the bid amount, right? And you can see in the output that now the bids are sorted, right? 
Um, to summarize new operators, we have new accumulators which can be used in the dollar group and dollar set windows field. We spoke about top end, we have the inverse, which is a bottom end. We spoke about last end, we have the inverse, which is the first end. We also have the max end when min end operators are good, right? Uh, for working with arrays, we ordered, uh, we added a new expression. So we saw sort array, which allows you to sort arrays without having to unwind them. Uh, we can also use the first 10 and last 10 to get the first or last element or the first n elements, last elements, and the max and n min element uh, to get the highest and lowest values within an array, right? Uh, let's go back to time series data, which we spoke about, and we have a sensor. Anybody who's worked with time series data would know that uh, the data is not gonna be perfect, right? You're gonna have missing data points, you're gonna have, um, null values and so on. In such scenarios, uh, we can use the new densification and gap filling capabilities to create and populate the missing data. Uh, consider this example, we have warehouse data in a collection, we have the inventory numbers for different, we have two products and the inventory numbers over here. Right? Uh, as you can see from this graph over here, we have data points for 23rd, 25th, 27th, but we are missing data for the even dates, right? 24th, 26th, 28th. Uh, in order to fill this, what we want to do is the first step is we want to create the data point, right? So we use the dollar densify stage. Uh, we want to say that we want to create for each date, we want to create this new data point and we want to set up range here, right? For the entire time period that is there for each day, uh, from 23rd to 24th, we want it. So we'll set step as one, the unit as the day and the bounds as full. So that for the entire data set, we create this uh, gap filling on here. And we also want separate data points for each product. So we'll use the partition by fields, uh, partition by fields and specify product ID. Right? The output will look something like this. You can see now that we have data points brought in for 24, 26, and 28. And you will have documents for each product for that specified date over here. The next step is to fill in the actual data points over here, right? For this, we use the dollar fill stage. And in the dollar fill stage, we could set the missing values by one of three methods. We could set a fixed value, a linear interpolation, or take the last non-null value and set it, right? Uh, for other than fixed, both methods depend on the surrounding values. Therefore, we begin by sorting on field which makes sense, right? So here we sort by date. If the inventory has been 15 on one day and 20th on the other day, it makes sense for it to be in between that. And then we partition by product ID to fill data for both products. And then in the output, we want to uh, set the inventory field and the method we are using over here is the last non-null value, right? So the output will look something like this. We introduce this data point in the last stage. And in this stage, we are setting the field value over here. Uh, we can also fill multiple fields using the same stage uh, using dollar fill. For example, in this modified examples, we are setting the values for three different fields, inventory, temperature, and motion, and we are using three different methods. Right? We are using the last non-non value, we are using linear interpolation, and we are setting a fixed value of zero over here. Right. Uh, and the final section I want to talk about is query improvements, uh, dollar lookup and dollar graph lookup are available on charted collections now, right? Dollar lookup is a stage which allows you to look across multiple collections matched on specified fields, right? For example, on this stage, you are matching on the EMEA region, and then you're looking up the transactions collection and finding the last 10 transactions for each account over here, all right? Um, so how does this actually work? When Mongoose gets the query for the initial filter on EMEA, if uh, the sharding key is present, the query will target specific shards, right? What And this is the cute part. With the new improvements, each shard will do its own lookup with the target shards, obtain the results, merge it, and finally return the documents to Mongo's, right? which then returns it to the client. So this optimization makes it much easier for you to use parallel processing over here. Um, the final stage, uh, final improvement is with search improvement. Uh, right now, you can use search across users' posts and draft with the new improvements. For example, in this search query, we are using a dollar union width uh, to find posts which are in, sorry, to find results which are in both the posts collection and in the drafts collection for a user. Uh, we can build in even more expressive queries over here. For example, we want to, for each child interested in arts, we want to find teachers in the same area who with art or painting experience, right? So we have the students collection and we have a query on arts in the path of interest. And we are looking up to the teachers collection matching on the zip code. And we are returning matches where the teacher has art or painting in experiences and hobbies, right? 
Right. So this brings me to the end of the section. If you're interested in aggregations and pipelines, Kadia has an amazing talk, which you should check out. And Marcus Egan has an amazing talk on search, which you can also check out. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Caesar, who's going to take you through amazing new improvements to data management and data security. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, if you can stop sharing, I would appreciate it. Thanks for that. Uh, let me actually share my desktop here. Hey, I hope you can see my desktop. As Karthik mentioned, I am, my name is Cesar Rojas. I am a pro marketing for core database, and I'm gonna be responsible for the second part of the webinar, focusing both on uh, data security and operational efficiency. And first, again, we're gonna start with data security, specifically a uh, new feature called credible encryption to encrypt your data. And as you probably know, encryption is, uh, is hard because we know we have to keep our data secret we know that data flows through networks. We know the data is stored on these drives. And we know we have to do queries against data. So that process is relatively uh, complex. And so far, you know, we have state-of-the-art encryption, quote unquote, state-of-the-art, uh, that we provide and many vendors provide, uh, where you know you have encryption in transit uh, through um, data secure networks. Uh, transport layer security, and you also have encryption at rest, where you have volume encryption and storage in engine encryption, which we actually provide those two as part of MongoDB. Uh, but uh, we really believe this model is, uh, or this state of the art, quote unquote, is not enough. Um, and it's not enough because uh, when you consider this framework and you feel good about yourself, and you should take a deep breath and realize your framework is far more vulnerable for the most sensitive data that you thought it would be. That is because no matter how much you encrypt all data, that data is actually decrypted in memory. And when you decrypt memory, uh, data in memory, you open your database to many issues, it's, you know, especially you, know, you have problems like malicious or negligent DBAs, you have malicious or negligent root operators on your OS, you're opening yourself to a virus like Meltdown or just bad actors trying to get, get into that uh, data decrypted in memory. So uh, looking at this, a uh, few releases ago, we actually launched a solution uh, called client-side field level encryption. And what client-side field level encryption did was that it secured the data encrypted in database and encrypted in the client application. So that was uh, kind of a decent solution, but unfortunately it took away a large portion of the database functionality. So it limited queries, scans, aggregations. Your data was secure, but uh, it wasn't a real choice because it didn't give you query flexibility, right? So what we want for you to imagine now is having your data encrypted on the server while supporting rich query capabilities. So Im imagine true encryption in use where the data is completely encrypted on the server where no human or software fault on the server can let the server read your data, but you can still do scans, suffix and prefix searches and you can still find the data under that model. Uh, many other databases consider this impossible, but we made it happen over a development uh, that we think is actually really breakthrough, which is queryable encryption. Uh, you know, it's a breakthrough development where we actually um, actually spend a number of uh, months developing a solution that has been designed by pioneers of encrypted searches specifically uh, PhD cryptographers and a team of about 40 plus engineers involved in this uh, project. And the goal was to, you know, both uh, being able to have encrypted server, the, uh, the, crypt, the data being decrypted on the client and uh, with full actually query flexibility. Uh, 
in many ways, this is considered magic and, and it's in some way, one of the major 6.0 features uh, that we are really differentiating uh, when you compare with other database servers. So queryable encryption works this way. Let's say you are looking for a specific social security number. So you start a, a regular query. I'm going to find all billing records for this single social security number. Nothing complicated here. This is not critical. You don't need cryptographic knowledge to make this happen. It's just a query. When that query reaches uh, uh, you know, the database, then I'm going to move an encrypted key to the server. And as a result of that on the server, when it gets that, you know, that to the server, it finds multiple records with that specific uh, security number for you know, the specific payer, uh, John's Glee. All records are encrypted in a different way, right? Uh, and actually, none of those records are able to be uh, uh, decrypted uh, in the database, right? So the decryption really happens on, uh, on the client. Uh, it, they actually, these records are sent back to the client and only on the client, the records are decrypted, showing all the records for uh, this specific payer that we were uh, talking about. So that's kind of the magic, right? So you still have you know, all the records uh, encrypted in database and you can actually run rich queries uh, against the database and the data is gonna be decrypted on the client. So queryable encryption gives you uh, the ability to actually encrypt your most sensitive uh, fields. You can have rich expressing uh, queries on running on the, um, on the database. Today we support equality searches on randomly encrypted data. And in the future, we're gonna support range scans, suffix, prefix, and substring searches over the coming months. Uh, your circle of trust no longer has to include either for negligence or malice on your data platform or cloud provider. Uh, you don't need encrypt, you know, knowledge about cryptographic knowledge or experience. You just need to turn this on and it's gonna work for you just running your regular queries. Uh, we support the standard cryptographic, probably correct primitives. And we're gonna, we're gonna open this and uh, publish the code and algorithm, algorithms, algorithms related to this technology and the math behind it. So we're gonna make it public. Uh, so we really you know, encourage you to, tie, to try credible encryption. It's, it's really, as we mentioned before, groundbreaking. It's very unique. You will not find it anywhere else but with MongoDB. So if you really need safe encryption, we provide you that capability. So let me move forward now to uh, more of operational efficiency topics of, of the 6.0 release or related to the 6.0 release. First one is actually cluster to cluster sync. As you probably know, you have been evolving your databases in different envir environments, depending on where you wanted to run the application. You, know, you, have, you have applications running on Atlas, you have applications roll, running, running on a self-managed uh, cloud mode, you have applications running on premises. You have applications running on near, near IoT devices, edge clusters. So all that data has been evolving in a separate way. And what we have been created throughout the years is that we have many silos, right? There's no really synchronization of data between the different clusters, right? So when you have an environment like a production cluster and then you want to be able to create a cluster just for development using the same data as a production cluster. You know, that's a need that you have in your team. You also have a need to synchronize data with different uh, workloads. Like, you know, if you, say you have your production cluster and, and it's an operational database, you want to completely replicate that data or synchronize that data with your analytic clusters. So right now, the only way to do that is through some of the tools that we have released, right? So uh, you're probably familiar with Mongo Mirror or Live Migrate. That is enough. This, these tools are specifically for migration. They don't support continuous synchronization. So it's a one-time thing. You move data from source to target and then 
that's it. Uh, so you're not able to continue to synchronize data between the two. And, and they don't support charted clusters, so specifically in the case of uh, live migrate. Uh, you also you know, can move data from source to target through backup and import. Uh, you need to do Mongo dump and Mongo restore. That requires a downtime. It takes a long time. And uh, it's, you know, it keeps, keeps you on, offline. So you're not going to be able to actually run your clusters. And the third uh, you know, way to move data from source to target is actually, actually through Kafka and the MongoDB Kafka connector. But then your uh, team is going to require specialized expertise in these technologies. So it's not real, it's not real solution, actually, those, these three. Uh, because once you move the data, as I mentioned before, you're going to actually be disconnected and you're not going to be able to continue to synchronize data between sources and targets, right? But the goal, or what if, the goal would be if, if there, were, there was a faster and more seamless way to move data across cluster that would be continuously synchronizing data between sources and targets. And that is exactly what cluster to cluster sync provides, right? It is continuous, unidirectional at this point, is not bidirectional, it's unidirectional data synchronization between uh, you know, source and target of, of different clusters in different environments, right? And when I'm talking about different environments, is that you can really move data from on premises to Atlas. You can move data from on premises to on premises. You can move data from Atlas to Atlas. You can move data from, us, from Atlas to on premises. And we have some customers that are actually implementing this. You can also move data from Edge to Atlas or from Atlas to Edge clusters. So that is, a, you know, give you real flexibility on your sources and targets, right? So, and that way you can divide, you know, where your data is running and, and the workload. So what really provides you the value to you is that you can expand innovation beyond the limits of a single cluster, right? So if you have your operational cluster running your application, you can move, uh, you can synchronize data with an analytics cluster, as I mentioned before, right? And those are two different clusters, two different workloads you can do more with the same data. You also have full control over what's happening, right? So you can start, stop, pause, and resume uh, your synchronization, right? So it's basically you can control 100% of what's happening. And the third value to you is that actually we do, do, do this actually with full reliability. Data consistency is guaranteed in this closer to closer synchronization process. So if we had to, you know, kind of summarize what uh, closer to closer synchronization provides or closer to closer sync provides is that, again, it's continuous synchronization. You can, you know, pause it and resume it. You have full control. We support different environments, as I mentioned before. We support charted clusters that other tools, you know, did not support. We provide high resiliency, and we actually have the ability to uh, reverse direction. If you are synchronizing data from cluster A to cluster B, now you can reverse direction. And instead of doing that, you can uh, synchronize data from cluster B back to cluster A. Uh, again, this is not bidirectional. It's unidirectional, but you're reversing the direction of the data. So the goal is that, you know, your development team is going to have fresh data all the time. Your analytics team are going to have fresh data on the, all the time, and they can do and these are separate workloads, uh, separate clusters, uh, and you can you know diversify the processing of the same data. So we have many use cases. Of course, you know we have migration. Uh, to Atlas as a very common use case. If you're looking to move away from on-premises, uh, move away from community into Atlas, you know, this provides you with a seamless migration into um, MongoDB Atlas. Uh, you know, we provide support for uh, your software development lifecycle, where we can, you can have a cluster for development, a cluster for testing, 
a cluster for production. You can have clusters dedicated to audit and compliance. You know, you have your, your cluster for operations only, and then you have a cluster that is there only for auditing. Uh, so that actually provides you support for any regulations and compliance. You can have clusters I mentioned before dedicated to only analytics. And you, we can also provide what is called a stress, stress exit. Uh, let's say that you are in Latin America or Asia, and there's a specific government mandate that you need to move away from a public cloud uh, into uh, your uh, on-premises facility uh, in a specific amount of time, we provide you the ability to do that, right? And we see a lot of those use cases, especially in financial services, in those two regions of the world, right? Latin America and Asia. Um, so we have many customers that are very supportive of what we're doing. You know, we have a state of Utah, uh, same pretty much a cluster to cluster. We'll simplify the migration of MongoDB clusters from local data centers into the cloud in a multi terabyte environment. And they're also saying that we will expedite migration timelines in a considerable way. Uh, ultimately saving taxpayers money. Uh, so that's uh, great support from the state of Utah. We also have customers in Europe. Amadeus is basically using us on a software development lifecycle uh, to actually improve their operations. So um, we really invite you to consider cluster to cluster to create uh, new environments and to innovate uh, in your applications using the same data. Definitely uh, something that you wanna consider. Uh, one last thing I wanna say about cluster to cluster, it's, an, it's actually an external tool to 6.0 uh, that is downloadable, uh, but it only supports at this point 6.0 and above, right? So that's why we're talking about cluster to cluster in this 6.0 release, but it's, it's, it's actually an external tool to the server that you can download. Let me move forward into the last feature that we're gonna to cover today. And there are actually more features that are, we're not covering, but uh, we're gonna tell you how you can learn about the other features that we're not covering on the webinar, which is initial sync via file copy. So initial sync is how a replica set member in MongoDB loads a full copy of data for an existing member. Basically, this process occurs when users are adding new nodes to replica sets to improve resilience. It, initial thing is also used to recover replica set members that have fallen too far behind the other members in a cluster. So initial sync is actually not new. You, we had initial sync uh, with logical initial thing, sync uh, a few releases ago. So basically we use the upload, upload to replicate the read and write operations one at a time. What well, we find out that this was extremely, extremely slow process for some, for some customers with very large data. So the new capability, which is a file copy initial sync, it leverages wire tiger backup cursors and copies uh, files that contain a uh, you know, bulk of operations to the new node. What we have found in our test is that this can be four times faster. So MongoDB will copy files from the file system of the source node to the file system of the target node. This process is actually faster in, in our uh, test uh, over a logical initial sync. The way you enable this is uh, through a configurable parameter in 6.0 called initial sync uh, method which can be logical or uh, file copy based. If you really wanna in, you know, improve the time of, uh, you know, sync, uh, of initial sync on your uh, notes, you know, we really uh, encourage you to actually try file copy based initial sync, as, which is part of 6.0. So again, uh, we have many other features that we're not covering today. Uh, but um, we encourage you to get started with 6.0 and their tools and actually um, their resources you can look 
and read about other uh, features that we include on 6.0. But first we invite you to actually try MongoDB Atlas, right? So uh, you can start, you know, uh, Atlas very easily and uh, download it and start playing with 6.0. You can read about the other features I was, I was mentioning uh, on the 6.0 blog post or the release notes. And we're very excited about 6.0 and welcome you to try all these new capabilities. We're constantly listening to you, our community, constantly innovating and making improvements that are really needed by you. You know, you are the center of everything that we do. We are very uh, customer centric and community centric and we try to serve you the best way possible. So with that in mind, you know, I'd like to move into a quick poll about this uh, webinar, uh, but please stay online because right after this, we're gonna have a QA session with a number of um, actually as senior pro managers and that are here to help you and answer all your questions along with Kartik and myself. So I'm gonna stay on this slide for only two minutes and then I'm gonna move to the Q and A. And um, please feel free to ask any questions uh, as we are completing the quick poll so we can actually interact with our team. Okay, let's move forward into our Q&A. So we have a number of experts here. Uh, we have Katya on Query, we have Alan on C2C and Replication and Cynthia in Data Security. Unfortunately, Michael had an emergency, is not gonna be able to make it. Uh, we will also have another colleague online, Ramad, also working with Cynthia on Data Security. So, we now start, uh, we now open the floor uh, to our panelists and start ans answering as many questions as possible here. Okay. There's a couple of questions on cluster to cluster. I think Alan would be able to answer them. Alan, do you want to unmute yourself so I can ask you the questions? Yes. Uh, one of the questions I see is cluster, 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 cluster sync. Uh, is it controllable? Uh, can we sync every 15 minutes or any amount as opposed to real time? We do have the ability to pause and resume. Uh, we don't have anything programmatic uh, where we get set uh, when you want to sync, but we do have the ability to pause and resume. Um, this You can do this uh, as long as you want. Uh, so this is the, 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 the place where you could do it, when you could set this. Another question I see, uh, can cluster cluster be used for backup? How will, how performant is this compared to the backup from Ops Manager uh, that in large data databases, terabyte size does not perform well? Uh, one thing you can do with cluster cluster is use this in a disaster recovery DR scenario. Uh, you can set up a separate cluster uh, that is sitting outside of, uh, of your current environment, you could put this into another uh, virtual machine, you could put this into another data center, you could put this into another cloud, uh, and you could do this uh, live. Um, we don't particularly have numbers comparing the performance of uh, 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 of, of backup. This is really kind of uh, uh, apples to oranges in, in kind of comparison, but this is one use case we do anticipate uh, for cluster and cluster sync is the disaster recovery use case. 
Uh, one question here that I see is, are, are these slides going to be available? I think they will be. So um, just to summarize, we started out and we spoke about um, time series collections and then we moved to change streams and then the aggregation pipeline. Uh, we still have five or six minutes left. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to drop them in and we can take them. Let's see. There, there is a just question came in about the optimizer changes in XO. No, XO doesn't include the changes for into the optimizer code. Thank you, Katya. Okay. Um, there's a follow up question for you, Katya. <laughs> if you can see that. Uh, there, there is no concrete date for that yet. There's a question here from a tool. Can scene work, can process across to scene work from on premises to Atlas? Absolutely, yes. Thank you for more. Thank you so much for your question, Atul. It has to be 6.0 to 6.0 though. That's the only thing that you need to consider. Uh, six, six zero or and above actually at this point. There's a question on queryable encryption too, whether it can be used by Realm. Um, Cynthia, do you wanna answer that one? For sure, I can answer that live. Uh, yeah, so queryable encryption does not work with Realm. You actually need one of the um, uh, drivers that actually does the encryption and decryption on the client side. Um, uh, we will be looking at it in the future, um, but uh, you know, not not sure if we'll be able to support Realm. Um, but it is not uh, currently supported. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a few requests for the MongoDB talks on queryable encryption. I can throw that in. This question on cluster to cluster sync. Uh, Caesar, Alan, do you want to take this? Cluster to cluster sync uh, for DR fail over, is it automatic or do we need to tweak connection string? Uh, is up to, it is uh, still dependent on the application to change connection string to the new cluster for disaster recovery. And there's one more, which is that can the target be only set to read only privilege or read write privilege? And would one source be synced to multiple targets? Uh, first part of the question uh, the destination cluster, uh, there, there is a flag you can set in cluster cluster sync to make uh, the destination read only. Uh, so we block the writes, uh, any, any, any new incoming writes to the destination cluster. Uh, and the second part of the question was, can you do, uh, was it many to one or one to many? One to uh, many. Uh, one to many. Uh, at this point right now, this is really a one to one uh, relationship. Uh, we do intend to expand into this in our future roadmap. All right. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. Uh -huh. I think, Alan, this is another one for you. I don't know if it is for you, though, but um, there's a question on with efficient file copy sync available. What is the need to retain logical sync? Can you, can you repeat that question again? So with, um, I don't understand. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with efficient file copy sync available, what is the need to retain logical sync? There are still some uh, areas where you cannot use file copy uh, based initial sync. Uh, more uh, details about that uh, could be available in the documentation. Uh, we do still want to leave uh, both options available for customers. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. While we still look at some of the questions that's coming in, just a small reminder, we had the poll put up. Um, if all of you could give your feedback on what you thought about the webinar, what you thought about all the answers that we had, it will be very useful for us. Thank you.
Right, yes. We we want to understand when, what you think about our webinars and improve them for you and you know, cover what you are you care the most. There's a question here for Cynthia. How do we enforce policy on local MongoDB users login and password? Uh, so we don't, um, so if you need a, uh, um, like password um, complexity, password policies. Um, so we uh, say to go to um, use uh, LDAP or, or Federated. Okay. Uh, Another question for Alan um, about initial sync. Um, how does initial sync handle indexes uh, separately? Do we have to rebuild them? Uh, no, initials as part of the uh, replication uh, that we provide with with MongoDB, uh, the, uh, in, uh, uh, the indexes are also replicated. Got it. Thank you. So Nora here for Alan, what would be the advantage of a read-only C2C sync yep. compared to a hidden secondary? Yep, so uh, there's two reasons. Uh, one is really separation of the, the workload. You would separate that workload uh, outside of your day-to-day -day operational cluster. So say you wanna have uh, a separate cluster for your analytics team or for dev environments, this is really a separate uh, environment for that. And also separation, the second part is separation controls. You could have uh, you give this cluster to a different team, uh, give, give this to a different company or different agency. Thank you, Ellen. And I see that we are two minutes beyond time. Um, do you want to wrap up, Caesar? Sure. Yeah, we want to thank you again for uh, attending and definitely invite you to once again consider Atlas, start playing with this. So you can actually get advantage of all these six old features and you know go back and read the release notes, uh, the uh, blog post about 6.0 and you know be able to understand more about the release and basically see what we have built, we have built for you. So thank you so much for attending today. You know it's been our pleasure and you know thank you so much, especially for those of you that are in Asia. You know, it's, I know it's kind of probably in the middle of the night for you. So thanks for, for attending and it's been not only you, but the Europeans as well as here in the Americas. Thanks everyone and hope to see you in a future webinar or an event. It would be great interacting with you.